President of Academic Affairs, and he's also a professor of politics and government. His scholarship addresses political theory and is focused on questions about democratic theory and democracy's historical development. His talk today, Why Pursuit of College Education is the Right Path, Why Western is the Right Choice, and What You Can Do to Make the Most of It is going to happen right now. Let's welcome, let's welcome Dr. Nee. Wow, thank you. Uh, well, I'll say, uh, I hope you've heard this a hundred times already, but welcome to Western. And more importantly, you are now a Western student because you're in your first class. So congratulations. It's your first college class. It's a real class. Take notes. This will be on the test. So, uh, so uh, I, one other comment before I jump in here. I'm, I came here uh, probably... On average, you guys are about 18, you guys and women are about 18 years old. So I came here about 20 years ago, just before you were born. And I came from California, a warm climate. Some of you, I know because I met your parents last night, are from California. A few of you are from Texas and other warm climates. I want to tell you something. This is Taylor Hall right here, the building that we're in right now. This was the original building at Western. Uh, Western opened in 1912. And for those of you that came from warm climates, this is called snow. Okay, uh, it was a little bit of a shock. The first time I visited Gunnison, it's like maybe in May or something like that. I flew in for my graduate school, UCLA, going to get a job in the mountains because we, my wife and I, spent all our time in the mountains, and we came over Monarch Pass just uh, to the east of here, and we couldn't see in front of our car because it was a blizzard, like in May or June. So, uh, welcome to Gunnison. You know, it's it's an, it's an adventure, I promise. So I, I was encouraged by some of my uh, professor colleagues to share a little bit of my story with you to introduce this talk. Um, so like about a third of you in the audience, uh, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Okay? And I remember when uh, my parents dropped me off at college, just like is happening for, for you, some of your grandparents or friends or, or other relatives. But I remember when I got dropped off to college and you know, bluntly, it was kind of lonely, didn't know anybody. And my undergraduate school was UC Santa Cruz, which back then was a pretty small school. Today, it's a large school. Uh, and, uh, you know, my parents dropped me off. I was the first person in my family to go to college. It was a little intimidating and lonely. And, uh, you know, I wasn't sure if I belonged there, right? Uh, like a majority of you in the audience, I worked in college at fast food places and grocery stores and so on to get through college. Probably a little too much. It probably affected my grades, my academic performance. Um, I remember I didn't have very much money that first year of school. And, but one of the ways my parents helped me is they gave me a gas card, right? And my grandmother lived three, three hours away in Sacramento, for those of you who are familiar with Northern California. And on the weekends, I didn't have enough money to do my laundry. So I used the gas card to drive, to do a three-hour drive to do my laundry at my grandmother's house. And really, because I was a little homesick, it was about seeing my grandmother, who I miss these days, because she's not around anymore. So, you know, this could be a tough time. This is also, I think, you, as you find your pathway at Western and in Gunnison and this community, this, uh, this is a great moment in your life. It's a moment that's challenging, because it's something new, but it's also uh, uh, a moment that you'll remember and a moment that has the potential to transform who you are over the next few years uh, as you spend time at Western. So what happened? You know, I, I moved into my dorm, my residence hall, uh, met some people there in, in that residence hall, including the person who's today my wife, including uh, one of my best buddies. We're still buddies today. Uh, he was the best man in our wedding a few years after that. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm, kind of, I was, I'm very proud of him. He's a professor back in Illinois, and he came here and was a guest speaker at Western for a conference on the outdoor industry last spring. So, uh, uh, so you will meet people who will be, be lasting friends for you, right? What else? I joined a club. I did intramural sports and got to know people. In fact, our dorm... You know, we played softball, a few other things. Uh, it was fun. It, took, it takes a little time, but introduce yourself. 
meet, meet people, join a club, do sports. Some of you are in sports. That's terrific. That's a good community for you. Western, you, you belong here, and you will find your path here. You will be successful, okay? You got to work hard, but you'll be successful. And you'll find your own pathway, like I did mine. I was, like I said, I was intimidated, a little lonely, uh, but it'll work out. This is a great place, it's a great community. The nice thing about a small school is you really will know everybody. You know, you really will get to know your professors. So, uh, what happened for me is some of those professors rocked my world. They were great mentors. Um, they were actually pretty intimidating. I hope, I hope yours aren't. I, I think Western is, is a friendly, friendly, friendly place. Your faculty members, the staff at Western, will do everything to help you be successful. I'm not sure that was true when I went to school, but, but you know, enough old guy stories. I'm just telling you, it'll work out. It'll work out. This is a great place. Generations of college students have gone to Western and, and, and treasure that experience as one of the best experiences of their life. And when they leave here, it, 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 they always are very fond. Our alums come back and they tell us about how great the faculty and staff and the, their friends for life are. It takes time. It's not easy. It'll work. I promise you it'll work out. So I'll say one more thing about my first term in college. We were in the quarter system, it's a, not a semester like here, but um, I read some books, and those professors that rocked my, my world that, that year, um, uh, I read some books, and then, and then later I became a professor and spent most of my career here at Western before I became an administrator uh, as a professor. Some of those books I read my very first term in college, I teach today. I think that's pretty cool. I'm pretty proud of that. You know, going back to, you know, and, and I think I was off my rocker in some of the things I said about those books. My professors didn't care that much if I was wrong. What they cared about is if I didn't try hard enough. Then they, frankly, kicked my butt. Okay? But, and I think you'll find that. I think if you make an effort, your professors will support that effort. They'll support that effort. So, uh, let me talk about some of those books I picked up over li life uh, here for a little while. Um, and I would tell you, don't waste your opportunity here. Draw on those professors. This will become your home. This is a great community. What you, you're in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, one of the most beautiful places in the world. Explore Gunnison, explore Crested Butte, explore the mountains, explore this community here at Western. Uh, it's a great place to explore. Uh, so, so let me start with a, a, a simple question, but one that I'm going to ask you to think about today. Mostly I'm going to ask you to think about that first question, that first, that first bullet up there, the Headwaters 100 service project. Some of you will be, all of you will be doing that over the next couple of days. Some of you will be doing that this afternoon. Secondly, we're going to talk about another purpose you have here at Western, that's to get an education and, and, and earn your college degree. And thirdly, you're going to want a, a successful and fulfilling career that interests you, that, uh, that, that will, will fulfill your life. And, and I'm going to focus a lot more on number one than number two or three, but, but of course, I think they're all related. Okay? So, like I said, this is a real class. You're in your first college class right now. Um, I'm going to talk about three thinkers, and briefly. First is Aristotle. Okay? So, <clears throat> Aristotle was an ancient Greek philosopher. His years were 384 to 322 before the Christian era. He was a philosopher who invented formal logic and rhetoric, still used today in English departments, his, his rhetoric. Uh, he wrote about ethics and moral theory. He probably considered himself, more importantly, a scientist. He was a biologist. He collected specimens from all over the world. He was also a physicist, okay? Uh, and the Greeks actually probably had better science than for almost 2,000 years after, after the ancient Greeks. Um, and from my perspective, I'm a political science professor, okay? Uh, he was a political scientist. He, he collected written constitutions from the ancient world and, uh, and compared them, okay? And I'm gonna talk about that for a minute, some of the, the things he learned about. He's, he's sort of famous for two famous connections that Aristotle had. One, 
he was a student of the philosopher Plato. Plato was not a scientist. He was a philosopher and just worked in the world of ideas. Aristotle considered himself kind of a scientist. And in fact, the opening book of the politics, which I'm going to talk about for a minute here in a second, he says, observation shows us. So he thought of himself as a scientist. We're going to observe the real world, what we would call the empirical world, and, and, and make generalizations about it. Uh, you'll learn about the scientific uh, method if you haven't already. Uh, okay, beyond Plato, the other famous person he worked with and how he got those, those biological specimens from around the world is he was tutor to one of the greatest generals in world history, Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great was growing up, Aristotle was in the court as a tutor to Alexander. And then when Alexander went out and marched across the world all the way to India, uh, uh, through Persia and went east, uh, uh, Alexander sent back biological specimens from all over the known world so Aristotle could study them. So uh, Aristotle's a pretty interesting guy. Uh, and I'm going to just talk about one small part of his thought that relates to us. And that's that uh, uh, from what he learned about constitutions. So he compared different kinds of governments. And he talked about citizenship. The ancient Greeks had what, what we would call direct democracy instead of a representative democracy. Every citizen was supposed to show up and vote on everything. They didn't have representatives like we have, right? And these ancient democracies, he did, in, in this context in democracy, he defined citizenship as ruling and being ruled in turn, okay? Ruling and being ruled in turn. That kind of requires a couple of things. He, he talks about reciprocity between people, okay? Social trust. I'm going to rule, you're going to trust me to do that. And tomorrow, when you participate in administering the laws that we've all voted on, it's, it'll be your turn to be a citizen, and I'm going to trust you that you're not going to screw me. Okay? So, Aristotle's a little different than us in this respect. He thought that through politics, through citizenship, we could morally improve ourselves, that we could only reach our full development as human beings by being citizens. Today, we probably think of politics as, oh, corrupt. I don't want anything to do with politics, right? So maybe we can learn a little something from Aristotle here, okay? Why? Why, is, why did Aristotle think that being a good citizen could improve you and help you meet your potential? And he argues something like this. He says, there's kind of a difference between, being, between what he calls mere life and the good life. Mere life meaning merely, merely living, just being alive. So, mere life is to be self-interested. It's kind of like, he, he used the example of a wolf. I, use, I always use the example of my dog. My dog is self-interested. She's very happy if she's got a full belly and a roof over her head when it's snowing, okay, or, or raining, okay? She's merely alive in Aristotle's view. To reach your potential as a human being, you have to work towards the good life. And you have to, he's going to say, you have to practice doing that. What is practice? Just like learning a musical instrument or being in a sport. To get better at it, to get good at it, you have to practice. Practice being a citizen. And he said, the reason this will morally improve you and help you meet your potential as a human being is because when you do that, you have to think about the community's good. You have to think about not just your full belly and a roof over your head, you have to think about the well-being of others. And by doing this all the time, by practicing it, you'll become better at it. Okay? So the practices of citizenship, Aristotle argues, help you meet your potential as a human being. Okay? Only then can you reach your potential, and in the end, he wants to judge people by their contribution back to their community, not how rich they are. There were lots of wealthy people in ancient Athens where he taught and went to school later in his life, even though he, he wasn't an Athenian. Uh, but, but people, but by how, just by how well off you, you are, isn't how you should be judged in life. He thought you should be judged in life based on your contribution back to your community. So that's the first thinker I want to talk about, Aristotle. And, and, and here's the concluding point. As you go out on these service projects, as you engage in the practices of citizenship, 
today or over the next couple days with your Headwaters 100 service project, I don't want you to think about necessarily only what you're doing for others by what you're doing for your community by building a trail or something like that. I want you to think about what you're learning from it. Okay? So think about that. Don't, don't just think about how, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something for others. The community will be better because I'm working on building a trail. You're taking something away from that. Okay? So I, want, I'd like, I challenge you all to think about that. Okay, I'm going to talk about a second thinker. Two more. Alexis de Tocqueville. So this is somebody I've written about in my scholarship. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville was a Frenchman. He lived in the early 19th century. Uh, he visited the United States in the late 1820s when Andrew Jackson was president. And he went all over the United States. He was sent by the French government to study. It was, it was right around, I'm sorry, it was about 1830. It was right after the, there was a French Revolution in 1830 and a new government in France. And they sent de Tocqueville here to study prisons. They wanted to know what prisons looked like in a democratic society as opposed to the old dungeons in the monarchies of Europe. And Tocqueville brought his friend Beaumont over, and they went from the north, they went to small New England town meetings, which were almost like Athenian direct democracies, where, where citizens had to participate. They went, they visited wealthy industrialists and bankers in New York City and Philadelphia. They went to the south. Tocqueville and Beaumont meant, uh, met slaves. They met slave owners, by the way, he thought Slaves were like the aristocrats in Europe, that they were violent, and the slave owners were violent and lazy. And he's very critical of American slavery. This was before the Civil War. Uh, he met lots of small farmers. He met politicians. He met four former presidents during his travels. Beaumont hated this, his, his buddy. They, they almost drowned in a riverboat uh, accident. Uh, Beaumont caught pneumonia and almost died. He's like, he's like a Parisian, you know, wants to drink wine and coffee and read books and, and just like going out on the American frontier, he thought was absolutely nuts. But Tocqueville persisted. And when he got back, he published uh, what would become a very famous book. I don't really recommend it because it's like a thousand pages long and not all of it is that interesting. It's called Democracy in America. Okay? <clears throat> Democracy in America was published in 1835. And I think there's an interesting thing about democracy in America. He's, he's influenced by Aristotle. Okay. And what Tocqueville says about America, and what he notices, and this is a little bit from my own research, is, is he talks about democracy not as a form of government, but as a kind of society. To have it, he, he, he argued, to have a successful democratic government, you had to have a democratic society. Okay. Political scientists and sociologists call that a civil society, that's just the, the term. Uh, by a democratic society, what did Tocqueville mean? What he noticed in traveling all over the United States at the time is that Americans were joiners. They joined, th they joined organizations, they joined social movements, they joined local clubs, churches, they joined volunteer fire departments. Americans were joiners. And he thought all this activity from America, Americans joining activities, he thought, not that people voted, that's important to democracy, but that's not enough for a successful democracy. It said that under that democratic government was a democratic society, okay? And it was this, this civil society or democratic society was full of active citizens doing things with one another. That was very different. These active citizens were very different from the old, in his view, corrupt monarchies of Europe where people weren't citizens, they were subjects, and in his view, they were passive, not active. Okay? Subjects to the, to the king or the queen, right, in Europe. So, these citizens were joiners, and that was what made for a successful democracy, or developing democracy, because he was critical of aspects of, of the United States at the time, uh, was, was that they, they were joiners and they were active, doing things in their community. And you know what? Aristotle gets, I mean, I'm sorry, Tocqueville gets that a little bit from Aristotle. It's a similar concept. You can't have a successful community or democracy unless people do things to the community. All right? That's the idea. Not unlike our voluntary organizations today. 
Rotary clubs, Kiwanis clubs, other service organizations, churches, uh, service projects like in Headwaters 100, sports. What the, the, the basic observation, again, not too different from Aristotle's observation, was that we learn to be social. We learn to be social when we do these things. So here's kind of my second challenge for your Headwaters 100 service project in, in you thinking about doing this. Think about who you're meeting. Think about who you're meeting. Think you're going you're gonna to meet your new friends that are in this class. Okay? You might meet a community member. You might meet a professor or a staff member. Think about who you're meeting. Again, that does something for you, not just serving the community with the service project. Okay? So Tocqueville gives us a little bit of insight about citizenship and about what we might, why we might do a service project. Okay? So Aristotle, what, we're, what we learn from doing that, that, that service project. Tocqueville, that we're learning to be social, that we're meeting important people in our lives. That helps us interact with others and build social trust, right? It's good for our community. It's good for us as individuals. Okay. I'm gonna, I, I'd like to talk about one final thinker for a couple of minutes. Mary Wollstonecraft. So Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a book in the early 1790s called A Vindication of the Rights of Women. She's often termed to be the first feminist thinker, the first philosopher who thought systematically about women's rights. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, was English. She was writing in London. She was aware of what was going on over in France at the time of the French Revolution and was kind of inspired by it. Okay. She was very influenced by two very important people to the American Revolution. Thomas Paine, who wrote a, a book called The Rights of Man. You, you may know about common sense during the American Revolution, criti criticizing monarchy. And Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. And she, what, she, what Mary Wilson perhaps going to argue very simply is that uh, the rights of men should apply to women too. Okay? And so one thing I'll tell you about Mary Wilson Craft, uh, her daughter is much more famous than she is. Does anybody know who her daughter is? Okay, I'll give you her name. Mary Shelley. Who's Mary Shelley? Frankenstein. Frankenstein, that's right. Her daughter, uh, Mary Shelley, wrote Frankenstein. Uh, so Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, was a critic of England at the time because women could not only not vote, maybe some, rarely some widows could vote, but it's a pretty rare thing. Women had no rights under, under English law. Women could be beaten by their husbands. They, they, uh, they had to obey. They couldn't represent themselves in court. And, and, and importantly for Mary Wollstonecraft, women... Uh, 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 only, only the, the wealthiest women had access to education. Okay? So, so Mary Wollstonecraft writes the vindication of the rights of women and is critical of England along these lines. Okay? So, uh, two important claims for Mary Wollstonecraft that we'll want to we'll uh, take away here. One, Again, not unlike Aristotle or Thomas Jefferson, important thinker about education, or Thomas Paine, she's going to argue that education is necessary for a person to meet their potential. Right? To meet their potential. And how did she define potential? Same as Aristotle, contributing back to one's community. She said, without an education, you can't contribute back to your community. You can't participate in the economy very well. You can't do things to improve the community that you find yourself in. You need an education to do that, she said, to do, to do it best, to do it best. So women were underdeveloped. She's going to extend that argument. She's, she's going to say, like Thomas Jefferson or Thomas Paine, she's going to argue education is a natural right or a human right and make arguments for what today we in the U.S. would call public education. So, rich or poor, men or women, boys or girls, have public education. Why? Because with an education, one can contribute back to the community. They can be a good citizen. They can participate in the economy successfully. Okay. So, again, as you 
engage in your Headwaters 100 class in the service project, I'd like you to think about that and would challenge you to think about that as, as being a part of your education in your Headwaters 100 class. Okay? How is it going to allow you to contribute back to your community and to the economy at some point? Okay? So there are three challenges to you from three thinkers that I had, that I had the, the, the good fortune in my college career uh, to study. Big questions, okay? Big questions from these thinkers. Uh, uh, and those big questions are questions that during your education at Western, as you take general education classes, you'll be exposed to. You'll be exposed to learning about the scientific method, to quantitative analysis, learning how to think critically, work in teams. You'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be asked to learn how to speak publicly in your, in your communications class. You will learn to write. Guess what? These are the skills you're going to learn at Western in your classes, in your general education classes, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll take on what we call compelling questions. Okay? Big questions from thinkers in, in some of your, at least in some of the classes. And in your majors, whether it's a liberal arts major, like in the humanities, arts, social sciences, or, uh, or, 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 or natural sciences, or in professional programs. You need to learn those skills because those skills you take away from classes are going to appear on your resume. If you go to grad school, you're going to need to know how to do that stuff. If you apply for jobs when you graduate, you're going to need to know how to do that. You're going to need to put those things on your resume because the data show in surveys of employers nationwide, those are the most important things for successful career. This is what employers are looking for. They want somebody who can communicate, think critically, work on projects and solve problems, work in a team. These are all things you're going to do and learn how to do well as part of your education from your mentors here at Western. Okay? This is important stuff. This is important stuff. You're going to ask big questions for important thinkers. You're going to learn about things like statistics and quantitative literacy. You're going to think, you know, the scientific method. These things, as you take them away, whether you're studying in the new Rady Engineering School and learning how to code, still got to know how to write, right? In business, you don't know how to think critically and work in a team. You're not going to get far in business. Go to grad school. So I'll just tell you, uh, something like eight or nine percent of you will, uh, uh, as, as, as first year students, want to go to uh, a law school, okay? Well, guess what? At Western, out of the politics and government program, we have 100% acceptance into law school. Something like 20% of you are thinking, maybe I want to go to medical school. Okay. Well, guess what? Out of our biology program, we have over 90% acceptance rate into medical school or other pre-health programs. Okay. Some of you just want to get a great job. We're going to give, give you those skills to be successful in law school, medical school, other, other graduate schools or to get a job when you live here. So, so this is your first day of college, this is your first class. It, it comes to a conclusion, it's called commencement and graduation, and at least for half of you, if half of you graduate and, uh, uh, and walk on my side of the stage, the president's on the other side, I will get to hand you your diploma in, in four years. That's pretty exciting, and, and I want to remember you all, and, and I mean, it's one of the thrilling days of my life every year, is handing out this diploma at commencement. It happens fast. It happens so fast. I think if you talk to your professors or staff members, I, I blinked and then I was out of college and I treasure those years. Treasure those years. Don't waste that opportunity. It's, this, is, this is huge. This is huge. And it's amazing. And it'll rock your world, just like I found in my pathway, as you find in your pathway, there's something about it that's going to rock your world. And it will change you. It will change you and allow you to make contributions to your community and have a fulfilling career and thoughtful career that, that, that is cool. And, and this is good stuff. So draw on those professors. Get help from our staff and our, and our faculty. They will help you be successful. By the way, 
you know, oh, I'm a good student, you know, I, I wasn't a very good student in high school, by the way, I was kind of a luck, a, you know, a B student, basically. Uh, same in college, I, I became a better student later, when I worked less, by the way. Um, but, but I thought, ah, oh, you know, I'm a decent student, I can work hard, I can get through. That's not what it's about. Learning is a social thing. The best students don't, don't do it, they have to work hard and study hard by themselves. The best students, though, understand, so everybody in the room, I want you to hear this, get help, okay? Talk to your professors, go to the academic resource center, take advantage of our staff, get help. The best students don't try to do it alone. It's like, oh, I don't understand. Go to your professor's office hours, ask questions. I'm having trouble writing, go to the writing center like uh, Dr. Smith was talking about at the beginning. Get the help you need to be successful. That's what, you know, that's what college is all about. It's not trying to do it by yourself. Right? Just like you know, uh, finding your path is going to involve making new friends, some of whom I think will be lifelong friends. Right? Uh, uh, get the help you need, because that is what learning is about. It's, it's, it's always takes place in a, in a community. It's, it's not this solo thing. You'll have to do some solo hard work. But to be successful at that sort of hard work, you have to make those connections with faculty and staff that are here to ensure your success. Okay? So, on that note, why are you here? One, you're here because this is Headwaters 100 and you're going to go out and do a service project. And I challenge you to think about that. Two, why are you here? To get a great education and get a degree. Three, why are you here? to work towards, in the longest term of these three answers, having a successful career and contributing back to your community. Doesn't matter if you're in math, science, business, poli-sci, English, art, right? You will learn what you need to, to, to learn to be able to do those things. So uh, thank you for your time, and, and I hope I've provoked you with a couple of compelling questions. Thanks. Thank you.